Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Joining us for this segment, we have Jim Gold, co-founder and CEO of Steward Partners, Raj Bhattacharya, CEO of Robertson Stevens, and Brandon Kowal, Principal at Advisor Growth Strategies. They join us to discuss why M&A will play a pivotal role in the wealth management industry to heighten competitive pressure and scaling opportunities. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Let's go around the horn here. Jim, we'll start with you. Give us a brief intro about the company where you sit within the wealth management space. Sure. Thank you, Jill. Great to be here. So Stewart Partners is a hybrid firm, a broker-dealer, RIA, um, just about 10 years old now. We've had a really great growth trajectory, but that's accelerating. So about $35 billion in total assets today. About 25 of that is in our corporate RIA. Um, 200 plus advisors, 100 plus person management team. And I think one of the unique pieces of Stewart is everyone here is an equity owner. So we all win together. We all grow together. All right. And Raj? Uh, Robertson Stevens uh, is a, a six-year old RIA, although it's a 45-year-old brand. Uh, we started uh, with a basic premise that clients deserved a high-quality wealth management experience. We're about five and a half, five point three billion in AUM, uh, about 20 uh, advisors around the country, and uh, all of our senior executives are um, are equity owners as well. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, Jill. You got it. And Brandon, where you are in the wealth management space. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jill. Uh, Brandon Kwell, partner at Advisor Growth Strategies. So our firm's about 15 years old. We're a management consulting and transaction advisory firm that specializes in the wealth management space. Our primary client is RAs, you know, hybrid, you know, producer groups, but all around the independent wealth space. Um, I'm also the primary author of the RA Deal Room, our research report we put out every year on M&A topics. Uh, that's out live free for, for everyone to access and uh, excited to talk about this uh, topic. There's always something fun and interesting to discuss. Yeah, there certainly is. And we were talking about this off camera, but it seems as if the trend was we had independent RIAs flourishing everywhere, leaving the wirehouses and going into independent shops. And it seems as if, um, Jim, we're, as they have grown, now the industry is thinking about M&A and scale, right? So where what's the size of the growth opportunity in wealth management? I think the, the growth opportunity is tremendous. And, and I, ironically, it's growing. There's actually more RIAs every year founded than there are acquired. So you have a net increase in the number of RIAs annually. As we chatted about earlier, Jill, I think about the uh, the pioneers of going independent, breaking away. Well, these folks have been out there in some cases 15 or 20 years ago, and now suddenly they go, gee, I'm looking at my retirement and succession. So you're also seeing a new trend we've seen is the breakaway uh, M&A. So advisors leaving a wirehouse to sell the business, not just to establish their own. Uh, and there's many reasons for that. I think legacy is a real critical one to them. They're worried about the legacy and the G2 behind them. Yeah. And, and Raj, it's interesting because as this um, succession plan is taking place, also we have a massive generational wealth transfer that's either in the process of happening or will happen. Yeah. And I think if you combine the generational wealth transfer with the additional demands that clients make of us and, and particularly the next gen will make, it, the, the M&A makes a lot of sense because the larger firms can actually deliver capabilities that are important for uh, for these clients. And, and that is partly why you're seeing this trend Jim mentioned earlier of wirehouse uh, breakaway M&A. Mm -hmm. And Brandon, how have demands evolved in the RIA industry? What are clients asking for now versus what they might have a generation or a decade, 20 years ago? For for a lot more. I mean, the, the end investor wants more. They want it faster. They they want it more efficiently from their services providers. And and that's not and that that's happening all over wealth management. So what we see now in the independent space, in the RA space, and wealth management more broadly is the race to institutionalize services, right? We have, you know, to Raj mentioned capabilities and and Jim mentioned the flexibility of the RA model. You really have this this confluence of factors, more wealth being created, more demand for services, people need succession in the RA space. And it's really leading the race to institutionalize across the wealth management space. So what's happening? More capital chasing after our industry, platforms getting bigger and bigger, right? We're redefining big every single year in the RA space. And part of that journey is M&A. And so, you know, it's a great solution for succession, but also resources, as, as uh, Raj mentioned, you're really looking at platforms developing really deep and broad skills across the, the end investor spectrum. And, and that's pretty attractive for 
you know, firms that maybe don't want to build that, right, or need a succession solution. So we're, we're here for a while. It's, it's going to be uh, very active for the foreseeable future. Right. Well, and, and Raj, too, I would imagine that technology has certainly played a role in the evolution with the RIA space, wealth management, and so forth. I mean, if you, if you get to outsourcing as well, I feel like, you know, between outsourcing and, and the pivotal role that technology has played really has been a big part of the evolution of the industry. Yeah, if you look at the amount of investor money that's gone into wealth tech in the last seven years, say, it's just, it's, it's a staggering number. And there every day there's a new wealth tech firm trying to solve some problem that our clients have. And people like Jim and I are the beneficiaries of that, and our clients are the beneficiaries. We can sit there, evaluate the best tech out there constantly, uh, incorporate it, um, integrate it into the workflow of all our advisors and, and our clients' lives, and that, that makes our, the entire client experience a lot better. And by the way, a year later, two years later, if someone else comes along and has a better mousetrap, we can replace it because all of these are uh, plug and play, modular, tech solutions. And the, the technology that an independent RA can offer its clients today, because of all this innovation that's happened in the wealth tech space is just tremendous. And, and actually it's not just the clients, it's the advisors too. The advisors workflow can be made so much easier because of this tech. Yeah, that's for sure. And Jim, it gives them time to customize solutions for their clients, spend time doing what they want to do, investing in and, you know, coming up with different types of portfolio solutions, which is really what the client wants is that personalized service because you're able to leverage these technolo technology platforms. Right. And you think about this very call we're doing, right? Five or six years ago, this would be unheard of, right? We'd all have to be in the studio, which involves travel. So there's a real leverage point for the advisors, but their clients as well, right? Clients don't want to have to travel to we find, especially the major cities, we have offices in major cities and those clients are much happier to do a Zoom account review or you know do it over uh, Zoom than have to travel into the city and, and meet their advisor. So I think the, the ability to connect, Jill, and you touched on it earlier, I think the clients are demanding that now, right? They want a great app. They want apps on their phone. They want a great website to interface with. They want to have all those, I think, optionality available to them to communicate. And then it's up to them to decide what's most appropriate for their relationship. Right. And, and Jim, now that we've spoken about how the industry has evolved, let's talk about going forward now. Why is M&A going to play a pivotal role? Who's going to be the winners and losers? Yeah, listen, I think you touched on it earlier, the fact that what is scale, right? So you think about 10 years ago, if you were an RIA, three to five billion, you would be considered a reasonably a scale player. Today, that's 10 or 15 billion. So what you're seeing is, again, the, the bigger are getting bigger. People want resources. They want capital. They want infrastructure. You know, you think about the whole process of a an M and A transaction. You know, from a first call to welcoming them as a partner, it could be six months, could be seven months. So you need to have a real deliverable there. And these folks very quickly see through the people who say, "Well, we hadn't really done this before, but we're going to start learning." And it's like, "That's okay. I don't want to be your crash test dummy. I want to go to a company that knows what they're doing and has scale and resources to deliver." But they do worry about the legacy, right? They really think about the generation behind them. And they deeply care about where do their clients wind up. And I think the culture and the resources available to the clients and the generation behind them is a really important topic that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And when you think about who is going to who is a prime acquisition target, if you will, and then how do you quantify evaluation on an acquisition target, Brandon? Yeah, I, I think the I agree with what Jim said, and I think the you know, why it's so pivotal going forward. If we really define M&A, I'll just define it a different way. What it is, it's a race for talent and it's a race for depth in markets and, and capabilities for a lot of these firms. I mean, institutional capital is all over the, the industry now. More is trying to get in every single day. And that's led to the advent of these large platforms in the space that now you have firms that are 100, 200 billion in AUM. We just didn't have that five years ago. I mean, these are these are very big enterprises that are, starting to emerge in our space. So who are the prime targets for M&A to your, to your question? Are the firms that add talent and add capabilities to and, and add the ability for these buyers and merger partners to deepen their reach with end, end investors? We are still a talent constrained industry, make no mistake. So we, we've been around the same level of advisors for you know several years in a row now, about just shy of two hundred ninety thousand. So across all of wealth management, so you know a lot of buyers were are looking for talent, looking for really good people. This is a people business to add to some of the things that was that were being discussed before, like technology and some of the scale efficiencies that platforms can uh, develop. 
valuations have gone up. Last year was the the first year we reported sort of a flattening of valuation, median adjusted EBITDA multiple just shy of 10. That was a modest decline from the year before. But, you know, compared to five years ago, it's it's huge. It's up over 40% on average across the, the industry. And why is that? So much demand in the space for this talent, for the capabilities, for the services that, you know, can be provided. Now, I want to take a step back and say, m a you don't have to do m a you don't have to be a buyer you don't have to be a seller but you know one of the things you have to you, you do need to know what's happening and be aware of how competition is changing around you because your your clients will become aware of it and the space has become much more professional than ever before mm -hmm. and Raj Jim had mentioned before that succession planning is highly emotional for advisors that are retiring and, and looking to sell their book or have it acquired um how do you take the emotion? out of that one and two how what are some of the challenges associated with the onboarding process yeah this is something that gets in an, in the talk of valuations and deal numbers and m a and and you know number of deals it, what gets lost oftentimes is actually someone selling their life's work right and there this is a very emotional journey for someone who has founded typically a, a company when they were much younger um and you know basically giving up the ownership uh, shingle on, that, on, on their clients who backed them all this time to, to a larger organization, typically to benefit those same clients. But it's a very emotional journey. How do you take the emotion out? You don't. This is an emotional transaction. You own that emotion. You work with the principal or principals. And he or she has to come along for part of the journey. And you integrate it in a manner that you take the best of whatever they have built in their firm and you bolster it with the best of what you have in your firm. And it's the general view that the one plus one should be greater than two. As, as Brandon mentioned earlier, talent acquisition is a big part of why m and happens. And you, ha you can't lose sight of the fact that you're actually acquiring human beings and, and, and a business that, is, that isn't you know, made up of people uh, who have relationships with clients and bring a lot to the table. So th that emotion needs to be part of it. You don't take it out. It's you just, you, you work with it. And that's, that's what makes this such a great business. Mm -hmm. And Brandon, yeah. that's a great point that Raj makes that you have to work with it. You can't remove people from the equation. You, you can. And I'd say in today's environment, you know, you asked one of the question, the winners and losers. I think the, the winners on the buy side of M&A will be the ones that can successfully address what Raj is bringing up, the emotions that come with it, the psychology that comes with selling a business. And to take that a step further, because there's so much demand, the winners will be the ones that can speak multiple generations, right? The founders and that next generation of talent. And really, because we have, we can't forget there's a team, it's a people business, and you have a younger team a lot of times in a place. It's about talent. How do you engage that talent, right? The buyer, the best buyers will be the ones that speak that. That are capitalized, of course, you need capital to, to be successful in M&A, but that speak that language that gives everybody confidence, not just the founders, that they'll have a lot of success. And I think it's a great point that Raj makes. You don't take the emotion out of it. You successfully address it and and, and build a lot of confidence with a, with a seller on why it's better for the clients, for the team, and for them. Right. And, and Jim, in the last five minutes here, let's think about the outlook for the wealth management industry. How do you see this evolving over the next three, five, 10 years? I think you know, we look at you look back 10 years from now, what we are today will, will be unrecognizable, right? I think you see the the top trends of the traditional firms are losing market share. All that market share is going to some form of independence, right? MA, succession planning, generational wealth transfer. So I think you see this convergence of all these factors that are in there. Um, listen, the players that have the scale, the capital, the resources are going to build huge enterprises that would be un unthinkable, you know, 10 years ago. So I think the, the change is going to be dramatic. Um, you know, I, I agree on the conversation around technology and resources. You know, we, we always believe in renting technology because it changes so quickly. But you go back to the emotion of M&A, and I think it, I always think about it very simplistically, which is, and advisors' clients have trusted them to make great decisions on their behalf with their money. And that the better advisors feel the burden of saying, this is my last act on behalf of my clients, right? This is the biggest decision when I make on behalf of all my clients. I really want to make sure it's the right one. So listen, the, the great opportunity is there for everyone. 
there's plenty to go around for everyone and there's lots of different models out there. So I think the good news is there's more choice now than there ever has been. Right. And Raj, how do you see this evolving? I, I think this, this is all about the client at the end of the day. And I think this evolution we've seen in the last few years and going to see um, over the next several years is overall better for the client. The client will get the same personalized service, the same fiduciary relationship they've had historically with their smaller RAA, just as part of a larger organization that can offer them better investments, better wealth planning, better technology, uh, just a, a more comprehensive set of choices, uh, a deeper bench, a succession planning for the advisor once they, you know, the advisor decides to retire. Um, it's just overall a better experience that that the M&A will result in for, for our clients. And I think that is why, if you go down to the core, why is M&A so strong? M&A is so strong because it is actually better for the clients. And that is, I think, the core point that, that we should all be aware of. Mm -hmm. and, and Jim, your outlook, but I want to tackle it from the perspective of you're saying we kind of plateaued in terms of bringing the next gen of advisors on here. As you think about the industry evolving, is is, is wealth management, are they doing enough to attract talent? Why, why is it plateaued? I think, unfortunately, the industry gets a terrible reputation. You know, they don't make good movies about people who have a CFP and take care of their clients all the time. Right. So people see these sort of horror stories in the movies. I think the what the better firms are trying to do is really start with interns and going down to the college level and starting to pick off the right people there. Uh, people need to know what a wonderful business this is. And this industry is filled with people of integrity that deeply care about their clients. Um, and it's a wonderful opportunity for them as well as the client. So I think we've gotten better at it. Uh, there's a lot of things the industry still needs to do, but I think this, there's clearly going to be a talent war and shortage that's going to become to, a, I think, an inflection point shortly. Mm -hmm. And Brandon, your final thoughts? Yeah, we're. I, I think from an M and A outlook perspective, I think it's talent, talent, talent. I, I think that's will be the theme that defines it going forward. You know, we there's never been more demand for capital in this space. Never been more demand for you know doing transactions. That's great, but I think it's it's really about the talent equation for you know this industry. The industry hasn't done enough, and and I think you know from uh, the standpoint of, and I think Jim's spot on. I mean to. To a large extent, you know, the independent wealth and financial planning and the 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 blocking and tackling of really important work, you know, in some some regards, it's not necessarily the sexy industry and it's not super well promoted. And it's also not centralized within our industry. It's like it's a joint effort that a lot of people have to tackle. And I think you're seeing it fuel a lot of MA activity. But I think there's also a path for people to remain independent and to preserve that independence and preserve the what makes I think the independent RA space so great and the better model. Talent is 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 so key, and we can talk about valuation structures, deals all day long. But in the end, it's it's really about the people and how do you continue to build that flywheel of getting young, you know, talented professionals to want to be here and want to contribute in our industry. And and I think we're getting a little bit better, but you know, it, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and, you know, and that's uh, that's the challenge that's in front of us. M&A or not, that that's the big theme going forward for the RA space, in my opinion. All right. All right, gentlemen, we appreciate the insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.